Welcome back to the Foundries Church YouTube channel. We're excited that you chose to connect. If you want to connect throughout the week, please like us on Facebook or subscribe to this channel. With that being said, let's dive into the current series called Short and Sweet. Welcome to the Foundry Church. As we get going uh, into our teaching today, what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time in a familiar neighborhood. Have you ever um, maybe gone back to your old childhood neighbor neighborhood and the houses seem so much smaller? You're driving through and you're like, oh yeah, uh, maybe this would seem familiar to you guys, these houses. We are going to be talking in week three of our series, Short and Sweet. We're going to use the springboard of the three little pigs to talk about the book of Titus, and you may think, this is heresy. I will prove you wrong, I promise. It is not. It is a great night to talk about this. But let me ask you a question. For those of us who've had kids, have you ever, do you remember the time when you left your children home alone for the first time? Anybody remember that? Oh, it's a harrowing moment, isn't it? You leave them at home alone, and you leave them with a lot of instructions. By the time they're 18, you're like, don't burn any, you know what, see you in two hours. You just walk away, right? You have very few instructions, but when they're little, you tell them what to do. You tell them what not to do. You tell them how to talk to people. You tell them who not to talk to, and you never answer the door when we're not home. And don't answer the phone and tell someone we're not home. Don't eat hot dogs because you could choke. Definitely not popcorn in case that little husk catches you in the back of the throat and you choke on that. Absolutely, baby carrots are adult carrots. We choke on those. Don't eat those. You may have water if you're famished, but other than that, sit very still and do nothing. Is that pretty much it? I guess moms are like, oh, preach all day. We remember those instructions. Well, I remember. For me, uh, for Erica and I, the first time we left our kids alone, I know, uh, I think Josh was late elementary school. If that causes you to judge me, stop it. Um, because he was like fourth, maybe fifth grade. Uh, let's say fifth grade for legal reasons. Um, but what we did is, uh, Ethan was little, we put him to bed uh, pretty early. It was still daylight out and it wasn't midsummer, so... Uh, we put him to bed, and we were going to walk. We lived downtown. We were going to walk to get coffee and dessert. And we told the kids, we're going to go have coffee and dessert, and we'll be back. And they're like, okay. We gave them crazy amounts of instructions. It was like a textbook on human survival, what Erica did. And you left Bella and Josh with this. The, again, very little. I think Bella was probably seven, six or seven. Josh would have been around nine. And we left... And we take off. We said, we'll be gone about 40 minutes. We walked up to public. We had coffee and dessert. We left them with a flip phone for emergencies. Anybody remember those? Hang on, I'm getting a call. Hello, right? And if you're really fancy, you had the next tell and you had a caller ID before you flipped it open. It was so great. Um, a simpler day and age. And uh, we left them with that. The problem is I didn't turn my ringer on. Walking back home, we're headed through the cemetery, uh, not to be macabre, but we live by the cemetery, so we're walking through there, and I feel a faint rattle in my back pocket, so I pull it out, and I have missed 11 phone calls. Seeing my house in the distance without smoke or a clown with an axe, I'm like, we'll be there in a minute. So we're walking home. We walk in to a Chernobyl-sized meltdown. It was horrendous. It was nuts. Josh is standing, this little guy, I mean, oh, I love him so much. He's standing there with pepper spray and a kitchen knife because he now knows that they are the boxcar children. We are dead and gone, and they're on their own. He sent, Bella comes running out from the back room, sees us, and just blah, blah, blah into a puddle, Ooh, weeping and crying, and we're like, it was 43 minutes. What? Like, what happened? There was no meteor. Bella is weeping on the floor. We find out that Josh looks out in the driveway. He sees our car there. And to our children, because we raise them right, when we say we're going to coffee, that means Starbucks, and we drive there and we get coffee and dessert. So they looked out and saw the car and thought for sure, 
Mom and dad were snatched from the front yard. Oh, we're on our own. Josh arms up and sends Bella to her room to pray. Isn't that awesome? I love this so much because they they just knew. They knew that it was over. They were wrecked. Oh, people don't always follow instructions, even when they're good for them. They don't listen real well all the time, even when it's good for them. That leads us into our story. There was a mom. She was kind of a sow. And um, it's for the three little pigs. That was an awesome segue. Some of you are like, excuse me. Well, she was. That's what they called her. Um, So there's this mom. She had three little pigs, but they weren't so little anymore. They were adult grown pigs. She couldn't feed them anymore, to which I say amen. And she's like, okay, I'm going to send them off into the world to seek their fortune. So she pulls them together and she says these things. Work hard, be wise, be good, and watch out for the big bad wolf. And she turns them loose on the world. The first little pig, so excited that he finally has some freedom, sees a bundle of straw, he buys it and makes just a little bit of a house out of it, not much, but he was able to be lazy and hang out all day with a makeshift home from straw. The second little pig actually walks by a pile of sticks and thinks, that's free, I'll do that. And he goes and he makes a little house out of that, now he's got money and he can be lazy. But the third pig repeated his mother's words to him over and over and over. Work hard, be good, be wise, and watch out for the big bad wolf. Seeing a brick maker, he buys brick and mortar and goes about the hard work of building a home. That night, they all sleep well. Well, one of them sleeps well. The other two are cold and wet because their houses really weren't, and they were cold most of the night. But they wake up in the morning, and as they wake up, this character is walking through the woods looking for breakfast. We know him as the Big Bad Wolf, but I know him in our family as Earl, right? The Big Bad Wolf is looking for breakfast. He walks by a pile of hay, and he smells bacon. Looking at the door, he's like, oh, that's a little house. (gasps) There's a piglet in there. Little pig, little pig, let me come in. Not by the hair of my chin, chin, chin. So he huffs, he puffs, and he blows the house in. First little pig panics with his house gone, runs to the house of sticks, goes in, and he says to his brother, we are in trouble. Why? Little pigs. Little pigs, now the wolf's happy. It's two for one day at Denny's. They're lynx, right? They're sausage. They know it's over. And he's like, let me come in. No, man, we're not letting you. Not by the hair of our chinny, chin, chin. And he huffs and he puffs and he blows their house down. And off they run to the third brother's house. Now, he's an industrious little pig. He's already had breakfast and he's doing his laundry. When he hears a panicked rapping at the door. He opens the door and they're like, he's going to eat us. And he lets them in. And then he hears another knock. And it's a big bad wolf. Let me come in. No, I'm not doing that. So he huffs and he puffs. And we all know the story. He runs out of gas. He can't knock down the house. So he thinks to himself, oh, you know what I'll do? I'll go get him through the chimney. Forgetting the industrious little pig is so. So he climbs down the chimney and the boiling water for laundry is what he lands in. He squeals loudly back out the chimney and runs into the forest with a red tail. When we look at this story, we can tell ourselves something true of the book of Titus. Something true of the book of Titus happens in the story of the three little pigs. It actually makes me wonder if there's more to the story of the three pigs than we realize. The link in this one is very clear. It starts out like this. Paul says, dear Titus, here's why I left you in Crete. He says that to him, and you might wonder, like, who starts a letter by saying, here's the reason I left you in Crete. Here's the excuse. So, 
Having drawn such a short straw, we should understand why Paul feels the need to qualify himself by saying, here's why I left you in Crete. Here's the deal with the Cretans. They are bad people. Who here has seen um, the pirate movie, Pirates of the Caribbean? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, the whole yo-ho, yo-ho thing. Um, so remember that town, the rum-soaked town where all the marauders and pirates come and it's just a wild, crazy place? That's what Crete is like. Crete is a horrible place. Here's some of their own authors writing about them. Epidemides says this, the people of Crete are all liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. Come visit. It's nice to winter, right? I mean, what a bro- brochure he writes. Cretans. This is uh, by Comiculus. Cretans are always liars. A tomb. They're a tomb. Two of my favorite historians say it this way. Plutarch says, all of his soldiers, speaking of a general, abandoned him, except for the Cretans, because they loved his gold as much as, they did, as bees love honey. And then Polybius. He was trying to play the Cretan to a Cretan. What he's saying is the junior liar tried to outlie the guy who's heard every lie in the book and lost. They're bad people. They're the worst of society. Leaving someone in Crete, well, it's about the meanest thing you can do. If you had to take a church planting class and you drew Crete, That means there's some sin in your life and God's punishing you. They are rough, rough people. And we can look at it and wonder to ourselves, what's going on in this? Paul says it this way, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Titus, one of Paul's disciples, was left to establish the structure of a godly church among people who were as rough and vile as you could imagine. They were as bad as it gets. And at first blush, we might think to ourselves, you know, it seems like Paul just gives him a bunch of orders, but he doesn't. It's actually, looking a little bit deeper into it, we see that Paul is really declaring to Titus that our faith in Jesus Christ compels us to obey Jesus Christ in the spirit of Christ in such a way that it displays God well. And the light shines brightest in the darkness, doesn't it? And that's what Paul is saying to him. Remember the story of the three pigs. The mom says, work hard, be good, be wise. Don't forget that big bad wolf is out there. And that's much to what Paul is saying. He's saying, look, work hard, set an example, be faithful. And your obedience to God will shine like a beacon in the darkness. And it will tell the story of what he's done in your life and what he's going to do in theirs. So I'm going to invite you to join me in the reading we're going to dive into today. Now, we're going to jump to the end of the book of Titus. But if you've done your devotions, if you pick one up at the at the end of the evening, it'll be on Jude this week. But last week's was Titus, so you wouldn't have missed what we're going to jump over. So please take a devotional when you leave tonight. It'll prep you next week coming into the teaching because we know this, like we set up our devotions so that you make sure you get all the reading we're going to teach on. Today we're really going to dial in on Titus. 3, 3, 1 to 5. It says this. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. Real quick, what Paul's doing here is he's saying, hey, Titus, I know they're really bad people, but don't forget, so were you before Jesus Christ. Don't get so high on your horse, Titus, that you think looking down on them is going to do you any favors. Titus, pay attention. You were once steered by all your passions, all your pleasures. You were deceived, you were enslaved, and you were a fool like the first and second pig were. He goes on to say, we lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating, uh, hating one another. But when the kindness of God I just just stop right there. When the kindness of God 
our Savior appeared. Like, think of what that means. It appeared in their life like sunshine on an unlit winter day. It warmed them and brought them to life. It says, when the kindness and the love of God appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteousness we had done, but because of his mercy. Don't forget, Titus, you were as evil as they were. It's because of his love and his mercy that you no longer are. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by grace, we may become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are, oh, they are excellent, and they are profitable for everyone. Why? Because what Paul's saying is, in devoting yourself to doing what is good. You are literally the juxtaposition. You're the polar opposite of a, an island dedicated to liars, thieves, and pirate culture. It was an island dedicated to piracy. It was a horrible, horrible place. Beautiful as all get out. Mountains, beaches, Mediterranean sun, but the inhabitants were evil. And Paul's saying, Devote yourself to doing what is good. Be a living example of what Christ has done in your life. Goes on in verse 9. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law. These are unprofitable and they are useless. Here's a cool historical nugget to throw in your cap in case you like history. In 67 AD, the Romans conquer the island of Crete completely and subjugate it. And they make it Roman. Before that happens, guess who invited the Romans to come and get things under control with these bunch of drunken pirates? The Jews. The Jews who lived in Crete had had enough of godless people ruining their lives. So they invited the much-hated Romans to come give them a little bit of civilization. And what Paul's saying in this is, Don't get into the argument with all the Hebrew people who are going to say, well, we're descendants from Abraham. They're useless, they're pointless, and they're unprofitable. Here's what I would say is our current equivalent. Tonight, just go online and tell us who you like more, Hillary or Trump, and enjoy the garbage fire that ensues. It's useless It's useless, and it's actually damaging. It's unprofitable. You can go on there and share all your political views, and people will love you and hate you, and there'll be nothing in between. It's unprofitable, and it's useless. And that's what Paul's saying. Stop having all the debates with the Jewish people. Just do this. Warn a divisive person once. Then warn them a second time. After that, block them from your Facebook page and have nothing to do with them, right? Give them three shots. Remember the wolf? He tries three times to blow the brick house down, and then he starts finding a new way in. People will tire of you not engaging in their quarrels, and they'll find a new way to have it. I have many friends on both sides of the political spectrum. I refuse to have a conversation about politics outside my own home with my own family. Because I've devoted my life to the gospel and I won't, I won't spend my energies dividing people about it, right? But here's the thing. I've got people who want to have that conversation with me all the time. Pastor Eric, tell us how to vote. No, never, not in a million years. Unless your vote is for Jesus Christ. Then vote for him and serve him with all your life. Write him in, right? I'm done with politics. And like Paul says, I'm not going to engage. And I have people who come to me over and over and over, and I say to them eventually, if you want to have this conversation, there's a number of pastors who will do it. Go find them. Get out. I'm not having it. I'm not going to give up 40 to 60% of this church for a political view and a temporary system. I'm going to devote myself to the gospel. But what do they do? They keep coming back, and Paul says, warn a divisive person once. Warn them a second time, and after that, have nothing to do with them. And know that they're going to be like the big bad wolf. They're going to find a new way in. But you may know this, that such people 
are warped and sinful, and they are self-condemned. Divisive people are self-condemned. Like the wolf, they come in to scatter the flock, create fear and disunity and scatter the flock. Paul goes on to say in verse 12, as soon as I send Artemis or Tychius to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis because I have decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. Paul in verse 14 says it this way, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for the urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Everyone sends you greeting. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Those are the words of Paul to the church in Crete, namely to its leader, Titus. And here's what we can say. Paul ends with a reminder to them that I think you and I should let ring in our ears. He gives a final few words of wisdom, and he says, really, look, we used to live one way, but now we live another. We're not sinful. You were once sinful, but you're no longer in sin, so do this. Live differently. I would say like the three little pigs, the mom says, look, I used to protect you and provide a home. You're going to have to go out and do it yourself, but... Work hard, be wise, be good, and remember there's someone out there who wants to eat you. There's someone out there who wants to eat you. And Paul is saying much the same to Titus. Let's go back to verse 14. Paul says, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for the urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. All right, church, let's be dead honest. How many people do you, and you don't, don't raise your hand to this, but how many people do you know in and around your life who you're confident they are not going to spend eternity in heaven? How many people do you know, and how urgent do you feel about it? Or are you like, I'm not going to hell. It's good. When it's really, really not, do we feel the urgency As Paul says, our people must learn to devote themselves, to give all themselves to doing what is good. Why? So that the light will shine in the darkness and people will come to Christ because it's in order, they do this in order to provide for the urgent needs. Church, do we understand what urgency is? I would say we don't. I would say we don't. I think we live in a culture that um, we have urgency around us. It feels like the tyranny of the urgent is constant, but it never really feels life and death. And we have to understand and know that we are called to work hard, not to earn our salvation, but to live in obedience to Jesus Christ. And the calling of Christ is hard. A few of you we're at the ball game with me this weekend for Zealand East. My oldest is playing his senior year. I know, don't look at me right now, Cochran. Um, but, like, I lost my mind. I love it. I am devoted. I get so into it. It sounds like I gargled razor blades. Like, I sound like Joe Cocker. Like, love lift us up where we belong. That dude, it sounds terrible. People are like, do you have a cold? No. I love watching my boy play the game, and I squeal, and I holler, and I have a great time. I'm devoted to it. And I have Christians all the time like, yeah, I love Jesus. It's just there's other things we're passionate about too. And I think what Paul would say to us and to me, even in the mix, is where's your passion for the gospel that matches your passion for a game? We will break relationship with people over a game. But we will never, we don't want to speak up and offend anyone speaking the truth of Jesus Christ. So here's the thing. We believe that we can trust that God knows what is best and we can obey him. We can work hard, be wise, be good, not because it earns us anything, but because the spirit of God has empowered you and me to live a new kind of life. To live a new kind of life. And we can watch out for the one who's always on the hunt 
to devour and destroy us. The big bad wolf, the one who wants to sneak into our lives and destroy everything God's doing through our living witness. If we're aware of him, we won't miss out on the mission. And friends, let me be very clear. The mission is the purpose of your life. The mission of Christ in this world is the purpose of your life and my life. And if we're devoted to Jesus Christ, if we're devoted to doing what is good and living in the calling and the power of the Holy Spirit, I will tell you this, that we won't be subject to the lies of the enemy who tries to disrupt our security in our salvation in Jesus Christ. Yes, our earthly security can get thrown into the wind in an instant, but our security in Christ never gets blown up. He never gets into our household and breaks down the family unit when we hold fast to who he is and what he's done, when we devote ourselves to him. Wouldn't it be awesome to be like the third pig? But deep down, anybody else a little nervous that you're one of the first two? It's like, I super love making a quick house out of sticks and being lazy. Anybody's like, preach? No, just me? All right, I'm good with it. Like, I love me a day putting a dent in the couch, you know, just watching something stupid like binge watching or whatever. Mike, you shouldn't clap at that. Um, but the reality is, like, I love, love, love just kind of chilling. There's nothing wrong with a little rest. But when it comes because we're not devoted God gives us times of rest. God gave us the Sabbath. He gives us time to really lay back and enjoy what means most. But the problem comes when we're more like the first two pigs and we just want to do everything we have to do so we can do what we want to do and we miss the kingdom of God. Wouldn't it be nice to be that third pig so that when people reach their breaking point, they know you're not going to judge them They know you're not going to give them a hard time. They can run to you when the enemy's trying to devour them. And you can be a place of salvation, of shelter, and hope. Because why? You're an industrious little pig. You're serious about the things you were taught. To work hard, be good, be wise, and don't forget somebody's trying to eat you. When we look at this, we can understand that we need to be like that third little pig. Not so that we can look down on the other two. Isn't it like if we're honest, and this is terrible, but let's just have a human moment. Isn't it so much more fun to look down on people than to be looked down upon? Anybody like, amen. I love looking down on people, right? And everybody's like, oh, you can't say that. Well, weird, because we all do it. We like to rank ourselves. And when the first and second pig come, we're like, oh, sweet, the lazy ones are here. I don't have to feel bad because I do volunteer. I do give of myself. We love to look down, but it's unbiblical. I love the third little pig. He's my favorite, not because he built a brick house, but I love the third little pig because when they run to his door and they beat on it, he's not like, yeah, Terry, Lloyd, I knew you guys were losers since birth. You guys have been bugging off me all my life. Guess what? Bacon and sausage, your day has come. Praise God that he finally got tired of your laziness and you will be devoured in the state you're in, desperate and alone. You're like, I would never say that. Yeah, but you would quietly not be on mission thinking that their salvation means less than yours. Make no mistake, the third little pig, when he heard the knock on the door, wrenched the door open, welcomed them in. He didn't have a lecture. He never said to them, you know what, little pigs? God helps those who help themselves. That is actually not in Scripture or in the three little pigs. It is not there. I don't think God helps those who help themselves. God helps sinners in Christ Jesus to come to life, period. Let us be a place that understands the high calling is to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ and then work hard at living into it, not to earn it, but to recognize we received it. Let's live in such a way that we are ready for the day of distress. 
that we are ready when people need to hear a word of comfort, of hope. Why do you think we want you in the Bible all the time? Four to five times a week, why do you think we want you four times on your own, once during church and then in groups? Because one day somebody's going to run to your door and tell you about the calamity that has fallen on their life, and guess what's going to spring up out of you? But the living word of God that is a word of comfort, challenge, and hope to a desperate world. And it'll come with an activity that loves them even as Christ has loved you. Make no mistake that you are not called to listen to a teaching. You are called to live a life that prepares itself to be a place of safety. This church is devoted to being a safe place. Come as you are. Meet God on his terms, not ours. Eventually, he'll require of you your sinful behaviors. We're not going to sit here and name them all on you. Come as you are. We'll even make the church smell like a nacho bar so you don't feel out of place, right? Because when we come as we are, we recognize in Christ alone are we saved, not by our deeds, not by our effort, but because of the love of God. What if you? No, not what if. You. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the church. You are the only place the world can run to take refuge from the enemy, from the one who seeks to devour. I invite you. I implore you. Work hard. Work hard in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Foster it. Grow it. Spend time with him. Work hard. Be good. Just seems like when you're being good, less bad happens. Be wise. Not because you're intrinsically intelligent, but because you listen to the Spirit of God, which is the Spirit of wisdom. And don't ever forget that we are in danger. There's one who hates our mortal soul. Remember that there is one out there who seeks to destroy you. So live in the tension of the freedom of Christ, but don't forget the high calling. Don't forget the high calling to be a refuge for the lost. And in some strange way, I just love, love the idea that suddenly this little pig had three, two extra roommates who were probably lame. How would you feel if your brothers came living back with you one day? You'd be like, oh, this is the worst, right? No, he welcomes them in. Church, let us live in such a way that our lives are continually made ready to be a refuge for a world being harassed, chased, and really assaulted by the one who seeks to destroy them. We, the church, should be a refuge. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, teach us to live lives that in some way will be a light in the darkness. May we not just do good things, but may we be transformed. May we be brought to life by the Spirit of God, for, for us who are in Christ, may we be brought to life by your Holy Spirit to live a life that in the end you'll look at and say that was good, well done, good and faithful servant. God, give us the courage to live lives differently. Maybe not get all the entertainment we want. Maybe not have all the downtime we want. But live a life that is purposeful, wise, and engaged in our moment in time. God, thank you that you loved us. Thank you that while we were out alone in the wilderness, you made a place for us to come. You gave us the Lord Jesus Christ as a refuge. Now, Lord Jesus, make us a refuge for people. May our lives be built up in such a way that people would be at peace when we're near. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. If you would like to prepare for next week's message, please click on the link below to get to our devotions. Now, devotions are an important part of the weekly rhythm at the Foundry Church. We hope that God spoke to you through this message, and we also hope that you join us again next week, because it's going to be great.